Hello, everyone. My name is Ankita Dhakar, and I'm the founder of Security Lit. Welcome to Let's Talk Cyber. And if some of the faces look familiar to you, yes, you're right. We've had a conversation with them earlier about what is attack surface management. So welcome to the uh, show, guys. Uh, Jonathan, I would start with you. Um, you are the founder of Who is XML API. I'd like to know how you started the company. What are your vision? Any challenge that, challenges that you faced? And yeah, please share your journey about how Who is XML API. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you, Ankita. Um, so my name is Jonathan Zan. I'm the CEO and founder of Who is XML API and Threat Intelligence Platform, also known as TIP. Uh, I launched Whois XML API back in 2010 to improve the core state of Whois data at the time. Uh, you know, Whois data uh, were hard to access, ingest, they were disaggregated and rarely complete. And there was not a, uh, a good vendor at the time. So that, that's how I started the company. Uh, you know, the, the situation at the time presented a real challenge to domain record transparency and slow down the work of thousands of security professionals and law enforcement officials. Over the years, Whois XML API's offering expanded to cover additional data sources. And the company is now considered a leading provider of domain, IP, and DNS intelligence. And you can learn more about us on our website, whoisxmlapi.com. And how long ago was the company founded, Jonathan? So I found it uh, about 10 years ago. Wow, okay. Nice. So today we will be talking about what is cyber threat intelligence. Um, before we move on to the subject, I'd like um, Alexander, you and Alex to introduce yourself to our viewers. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, Alex Ronquillo here. Uh, I head business development and I have for the past few years at who is XML API. Uh, in love with it. It's become kind of a, a new life mission for me. Um, we're not a traditional threat intelligence company, uh, but we do work with almost every uh, threat intelligence company that's out there. Uh, and, and I've personally spent thousands of hours uh, with our clients, uh, which are really some of the world's greatest engineers, and they're building massively powerful uh, threat investigation platforms, right? Uh, a lot of things, you know, are, are things that they love about you know, open source intelligence, internet scan data, the kind of stuff we do, uh, you know, it's very useful for implementing like security controls, heuristics, uh, you know, we're finding new techniques every day how to do that. Uh, and, and it's super interesting when, when you look at like a comprehensive snapshot of the internet and sort of like stare into the void, uh, if you want to call it that. And, and, you know, especially when you're looking at something that's like has some real cultural impact, things in the news cycles, uh, things that you see, uh, you know, on, on the headlines of Reddit and stuff like that. Right, it's interesting to look at the the internet footprints, uh, you know. But there's a lot of the work that's that's hard that our clients don't love, and you know, our, our main focus is helping those folks out and and breaking down those barriers and trying to get more visibility uh, into the internet without just totally losing focus on on their core kind of product strategy or having to negotiate suddenly with thousands of data sources or or really just spinning up like a massive engineering team so they can like reinvent the wheel as far as crawling the internet's concerned. Right. So all in all, uh, uh, you know, I, I love it. I've kind of become a bit of like a librarian of the internet, uh, the way I see it. Um, uh, but uh, do a lot of work uh, with Jonathan and uh, Alexander, Mr. Francois as well, if you'd like to introduce yourself. I do. So uh, thank you, Akita, first of all, for having us again uh, on your channel. So my name is uh, Alexandre Francois. I joined OE6ML API in 2018. I have a, a dual role as, a, as head of marketing, but also threat researcher. And uh, really these two parts of my work are really two sides of the same coin in the sense that often the most direct way that you can promote uh, a data security business is by highlighting what that data can do through some uh, data-driven analysis and, uh, and researches. On a daily basis, I also work with security analysts and uh, academic researchers as part of our research and media collaborations program. Awesome, thank you so much guys for the introduction. So I just move with um, um, Jonathan. So Jonathan, I would like to ask you, what is cyber threat intelligence? If you could tell us a bit more about it. John, you're on mute. 
Yeah, uh, simply put, cyber threat intelligence is knowledge about threats and threat actors. Uh, that knowledge is obtained by cross-linking and contextualizing data points connected to malicious campaigns. So by using threat intelligence, users can learn more about who is attacking them and the techniques uh, employed. They can also look for clues indicating that an attack is under preparation or might even be ongoing. And often security companies provide uh, distinct threat data points that relate to specific threats, such as phishing, typo squatting, DDoS, et cetera. Other companies, meanwhile, specialize in offering adjacent capabilities to support data correlation, analysis, and visualization. All of this is part of the threat intelligence umbrella. In essence, threat intelligence is based on facts and it is meant to be action oriented. It's all about helping users to make informed decisions as they detect and respond to threats. Right, right. and you know, a lot of evidence is required to make those informed decisions, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, finding that evidence on the internet is, <laughs> it's very hard, right? Um, you know, but when you can find those sort of indicators as security professionals call them, uh, you know, you start to get a better sense, I think, of like the behavior uh, of who it is uh, is on the other side of the table or or the metaphorical chessboard, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I think the you know the threat intelligence is uh, you know, very akin to kind of like the uh, the usual government definitions of intelligence around uh, you know sort of information that can be used uh, as like a, a a fulcrum or to gain some advantage, right? So my next question to you, Alex, is how is um, cyber threat intelligence collected, aggregated, and distributed? Oh yeah, there's a lot of ways. Um, mm -hmm. Some ways are actually surprising. Um, you know, first is open source intelligence, which is basically like uh, uh, I love it because it's so easy to do. Uh, you know, you don't need to need to pay for anything. There's a lot of free tools online. Google is actually a pretty decent uh, threat investigation platform. If you're just trying to figure out what's going on, on the internet. Um, but you know, from from the commercial world, uh, I think there's a couple approaches. Uh, one mm -hmm. which is really popular is like a reactionary approach. Right. So let's say uh, someone's antivirus or someone's mail system, uh, you know, a user submits a, hey, this is a phishing email or they market a spam. A lot of times there's uh, automation as well as human beings looking at those those reports. Right. Uh, there's some really good sources for things like that. I mean, you have like Spam House been doing very good work for a long time. Uh, fish tank, stop forum spam, virus total, a lot of different ways to kind of vet things and see whether or not they're kind of threats. Mm -hmm. um, but in many cases, that reactionary approach sort of first requires someone to report something or maybe like someone's uh, network or endpoint to start talking to another machine to then, you know, uh, be detected by some software saying, hey, this is bad. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, once there is, uh, you know, some 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 high confidence, uh, you know, events, uh, you know, this is where you start to see like the block lists of, hey, these are all bad IP addresses or, hey, these are all uh, domains related to phishing, that sort of thing. Uh, so it's typical for companies to like buy and purchase various of those feeds. There's free ones as well. There's a lot of free stuff out there. And they kind of plug and play it into their like existing security controls, whether it's like DNS filtering, firewalls, or just like generally blocking applications. There are some more mature threat hunting teams that, you know, start off and they look at those lists of confirmed bad things as a starting point. And then they kind of, you know, try to figure out what else is around that. Can I figure out things about those actors? Uh, you know, this guy who created 500 websites that are all impersonating PayPal, right? Can mm -hmm. they maybe get an identification on that person? Can they, you know, start watching them on the internet? Um, people who do that sort of work, uh, I, I believe is where a lot of the funner threat hunting stuff happens is the predictive side rather than reactionary. So, you know, that's a lot of where we do a lot of work, right? You, you have to use things like internet scan data, in, in some cases, social media data, uh, DNS mm -hmm. observation, really looking out into the internet on purpose before that bad stuff comes into you or your customers' networks. So, you know, you may be looking at hundreds or thousands of data points trying to see, hey, is there commonalities? You may be applying machine learning or artificial intelligence to try to, you know, uh, really look at billions of seemingly unrelated things and start kind of building the, the picture. Right, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and if, if you're lucky or if you're doing good work, you, you might start to illustrate certain trends. Uh, for example, uh, uh, you know, uh, Alexander uh, leads a research team and we find a lot of 
uh, essentially predictions. So we, we can predict phishing domains, we can predict malware infrastructure. And in many cases, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing it so early that it's uh, no one can really guarantee something has a malicious intent. Uh, but in some cases, it's pretty obvious what the intention of a website is. Uh, let's say the uh, the URL looks like it's a login page for a banking institution. It's asking for login credentials, but you know it's pretty easy to verify it's not actually owned by that bank, right? So, so is this always through a tool, or you know it can be done by, or it's mostly by a manual assessment? I mean assessment. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think a lot of the uh, initial theory crafting and playbook drafting is done manually. Um, mm -hmm. th that's at least how it works for us internally. Um, you know, I, I know there's other teams though who have more advanced uh, uh, research teams and calculation methods and server power and such. Uh, so they may be able to go and look at the large wealth of data using pretty much machine learning uh, and then really figure out some things. We've supported a lot of academic studies um, you know, some PhD level studies where people are basically saying, hey, can we, you know, predict malicious URLs using things like who is data, DNS data, things like that. Uh, and it sort of is kind of like an art slash science. So, you know, the science pieces, sure, you can teach a machine. Uh, the art pieces uh, in, in being able to almost be like a, a criminal investigator of the internet, right? Uh, uh, you know, you, you sometimes need, uh, uh, you know, a uh, human practitioner experience to let's say ask the right question from the data yeah. nice thank you so much that was a really good explanation um so my next question is what are we trying to achieve with you know threat intelligence yeah that, that's a good question i think from a high level the main goals of threat intelligence are to identify threats and vulnerabilities Mm -hmm. as well as given relevant pieces of evidence to help prevent cyber attacks. Uh, at a more granular level, threat intelligence has different use cases. Incident response teams and security operations centers, for example, use it to classify threats based on risks, as well as impact under different scenarios. Should an attack be successful? They want to know what to focus their attention on and avoid alert fatigue. And law enforcement agencies also use threat intelligence, though they look at threats and cyber crimes from a macro perspective. Mm -hmm. Unlike SOCs or incident responders who focus on protecting their organization's data and systems, the job of law enforcement officials is to protect the public and economies at large. As you can imagine, that scope really involves a lot of data, probably millions of records to compile integrate, analyze, and act on every day to keep cities or even countries protected. Uh, you know, we, we who is XML API is very strong in providing uh, a lot of the fundamental domain and IP intelligence data over the years. And more recently, uh, you know, thanks to our research team, we're also looking into, uh, you know, how we can provide our users and the security community at large with more, uh, uh, early detection methods, right? How do we, uh, you know, we take, we have tons of data in terms of, of observation and registration of DNS events. And we want to turn that into uh, actionable intelligence to tell the user early on if a website is likely to be malicious, likely mm -hmm. to be employed in phishing attack or, or other kind of uh, malicious campaigns. Awesome, thank you. So what does threat intelligence look like in practice? I'd be happy to, to start answering that question. So th th that's a very broad question uh, to, to start mm -hmm. with. I think threat intelligence can be seen from, from many different angles and you have a lot of data that you can correlate, put together and, and at the end of the day, draw some uh, intelligent meaning out of it. That said, in uh, in a particular research that we conducted, we we worked on building intelligence around uh, malicious domain names that represented an impersonation, or as we call it uh, often, a typo squatting threat to to companies such as PayPal. So it all started because we we extracted we extracted some files from our typo squatting data feed which specifies domain groups in terms of timing of registration and uh, string similarity. So 
in other words, uh, the feed will help you identify domains that looked alike and also were registered uh, on the same date or within uh, a few days, um, uh, within a few days, basically. So two, uh, those two characteristics, so string similarity and the fact that they were registered within a short period of time are indicative of bulk registration which you can uh, consider to be suspicious when it goes above a, a certain scale. So to, to give you a, a little more uh, specific numbers here about the research, like we, we started with a data set that identified uh, 13,000 domains uh, that were part of 2,000 groups. And we spotted that group that contain eight domains with the string PayPal uh, dash, uh, dash ticket. So we enrich that group every day uh, for about 14 days. And what we found is that progressively those, uh, those group of uh, those eight domains, they were being flagged by, uh, by the traditional malware engines. So by day one, I believe we had four domains. Now, what's interesting, it's not the domains that have been flagged necessarily, but the domains in the group of eight that hadn't been flagged. So by day one, actually about half of the domains uh, in our group hadn't been, uh, hadn't been flagged. So we had knowledge of those uh, because we were looking at different factors and the traditional data security companies uh, here. And uh, we, we have an ability to determine things and, and look at data. In a, in a certain way. And uh, using uh, that piece of information and uh, characteristic about the, this, uh, this group, we were able to identify actually close to another 1,000 domains that shared very, very similar characteristics. So I think that's kind of one way uh, that you can progressively build uh, threat intelligence. And I think that builds to, uh, to what uh, Alex had mentioned earlier. And uh, I think Alex, you, you may have some further ideas on to what threat intelligence can look into in practice. Sure, sure. Yeah, and, and you're right. Uh, the, the PayPal study was, was really fascinating. Uh, it's funny because uh, when you look at the, the tools that are being used, like let's say Maltego, for instance, um, you know, it, it ends up being a little bit like what Netflix and Hollywood would make you believe uh, 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 like a police detective work looks like, right? Uh, you know, uh, I remember the Maltigo graph for the PayPal investigation. It, it really did look like one of those crazy cork boards full of like points and yarn connecting this group to that group, but not that group, right? And uh, I remember it did take weeks uh, sort of for us to really look into that, that critically and then first, you know, look at the larger scope of, you know, hundreds of data points and then uh, start to qualify it a little bit, apply some critical thinking, uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, try to get a sense of really what level of skill is on the other side, right? Who is it that we're really looking at here, right? Is this someone uh, who's maybe more like on the side of like uh, the good old Nigerian print scams, right? That just gets sent anywhere untargeted and they hope, you know, for whatever uh, shakes out? Or are you looking at something where it's maybe a more advanced persistent threat group? Right? Is, do you see any evidence of them using, let's say, techniques of like tradecraft, for instance? Right. Um, overall, it's it's interesting because it's a, it's a, it's a bit speculative. Uh, you know, I, I find that uh, you know skilled actors will typically hide their footprints well enough so that you're you're really forced to read between the lines. Right. And and sometimes the lack of evidence can be used as a way to uh, uh, reaffirm, hey, this is the same person. Uh, maybe because they keep leaving that same lack of evidence in case and case and case again, right? And then when you start putting all the evidence together, you, you start to see sort of the the patterns uh, uh, correlate, right? So it's somewhere between uh, glorified pattern recognition, uh, but then also with some spicy elements of like uh, game theory a little bit, uh, depending on who you're up against, or or maybe even you know decision science and in, in, in thinking of uh, you know if I were this actor, right? What would be you know the best way to X, Y, Z, or what, you know, what, what would be uh, my favorite, let's say, hosting company to use uh, or, or registry, uh, you know, to register names with, right? Uh, you know, tying those odd pieces of, together, uh, you know, to, to get a better sense of who you're dealing with, what their intentions are, uh, I think that's a natural way to figure out what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting subject 
And I'm curious, and I'm sure my viewers would also want to know. So what is cyber threat intelligence sharing and why it is important? Um, uh, cyber threat intelligence sharing is basically the exchange of data among internet and security data aggregators. Uh, the rationale behind this is that nobody on its own has uh, you know, all the technical, logical visibility to keep track of all meaningful threat events. I mean, there's an enormous amount of threat events to start with, especially if you consider the deep and the dark web. Uh, from who's XML API satellite, uh, which focuses on the surface web, we see about 200,000 newly registered domains every day. We also discover more than 1 million subdomains daily and millions of IP and DNS events. Uh, we, uh, we partnered with dozens of uh, domain uh, registries and registrars uh, and ISPs and uh, security organizations uh, to reach that kind of scale. Uh, now, uh, you know, uh, on the surface web, nobody has all the visibilities, uh, but we as a data aggregator is trying to correlate and aggregate a, a, as much visibility as we can uh, into uh, the surface web. Um, so you want to make uh, uh, cyber threat intelligence sharing transparent. We want to make uh, the web transparent. So it, it is very important, you know, that we partner with uh, all kinds of organizations in order to achieve that goal. Mm -hmm. And do you only work with, say, big enterprises, or do you also help um, smaller sales, uh, smaller scale businesses as well? Yeah, we, we work with organizations of uh, all sizes. Uh, in terms of data sharing, intelligence sharing, we work tend to work with a bigger, bigger organizations. But in terms of the customer we serve, you know, we uh, do work with uh, uh, big organizations as well as uh, SMBs, entrepreneurs, and freelancers. You know, they can simply. Uh, log into our website and then start using some of our do domain research and monitoring tools, for example, uh, which uh, offer, you know, which is free to use in some cases. Right. That's awesome. That's right. awesome. You know, it, it's funny. I wanted to mention, uh, um, uh, it, it is really, uh, anyone can go and just make an account. Um, sometimes here and there, uh, uh, you know, we'll get a Google News alert and then we'll see we were actually cited in like a publication by like a journalist or something like that. Wow. Right. Uh, and, you know, we'd never spoken with that journalist or anything. But uh, again, you know, the data is out there. Anyone can kind of go and start asking questions. Maybe on, on top of that, uh, one point I'd like to make is maybe uh, at this time uh, and age, it's not really an option not to share data uh, when it comes to today's threat environment. I mean, you always have some kind of uh, arms race between the good and the bad guys. And then on one side, you, you have uh, security companies like Maltigo and Qualap, and they do an excellent job at connecting data sources from different providers. Uh, and they do that in a unified environment for further investigations. And then on the other corner, you also have the malicious actors who've been uh, sharing data and actually have made uh, pretty much a business model out of it where they, they would grab their hands on data that can contain uh, usernames, passwords, credit card details. And then they are going to sell that data and other threat actors are going to buy that data you could consider it in a sense that the data is shared and not just purchased and, and they're going to create all kind of uh, all kind of cyber attacks and, uh, and follow up campaigns from there. Yeah. So what, what are the what are the steps uh, in selecting a tip for your organization? Uh, the criteria for choosing a threat intelligence platform uh, depends on your goals and the most uh, salient threats in your industry. Well, when creating a tip requirement sheet, users need to identify their intended use cases very well. Also, users probably want to specify if each requirement is new or an enhancement to an existing capability. Uh, from there, they can compare tips in terms of overall functionality, cost, ease of use, and different implementation criteria. Uh, the capacity of threat intelligence platforms 
to ingest data from a wide variety of external sources also matters, be it through data sheets uh, or APIs. Uh, tips are only as good as the data fed into them. And this takes me back to the role of uh, Who is XML API as a provider of domain and DNS intelligence. Uh, we have worked with various tip providers who need a greater visibility of internet events that they could then link to threats and threat actors. Awesome. I just have another question for you, Alex. So for example, um, if a startup reaches out to you and they need help with cyber threat intelligence, how would you help them? And I just need a very high level um, sort of an explanation, like how does the process work? How would you help them? Yeah, I think uh, um, a, a conversation is where it always starts. Right. Um, you know, uh, areas to explore is, uh, uh, you know, uh, really, uh, is it even their work to do or not? Right. I mean, uh, just because you can buy a Lamborghini doesn't necessarily mean you can drive it. Right. Well, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, many small, medium sized businesses, you know, they, they not only struggle to kind of afford the cost of licensing platforms in many cases, but even if they purchase that, they may lack actually the in-house experience to actually operate that platform. Right. So whether it's us that can help, whether it's one of our, uh, you know, kind of industry partners or, or whether there's a certain direction to point, um, you know, it really make, depends on, on, on that case by case. Right. Uh, for some cases, it'll make more sense to just hire a great like managed services firm uh, that mm -hmm. could maybe help you spin up like a, what's called like a seam or a sore, essentially, uh, uh, you know, a, a way to to investigate threats within you know, your network, your assets, those sorts of things. Right. And it's really not unusual at all uh, to have almost the whole process hired out for ongoing detection response. In many cases, uh, you know, those providers uh, end up working with us to sort of contextualize those data for their users, that sort of thing. Uh, same time, you know, a, a lot of the Fortune 500, especially some of the larger organizations that do have the manpower uh, to really go and, and, and a dedicated team to proactively look and look out into the yeah. void and see, you know, what could be looking back at them. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, you know, those folks, uh, uh, you know, oftentimes have a lot more options, right? But you know, it does seem like uh, the security community, the commercial side at least, is trying to make more, uh, trying to break that barrier down, right? Uh, because uh, there's a lot of SMBs that are compromised and, and unfortunately for, you know, threat actors, it's kind of like uh, shooting fish in a barrel. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And I'd, I'd like to know if you or anyone in the team want to add anything before we end this amazing uh, cyber threat intelligence webcast. Uh, I think, yeah, just to uh, reinforce what Alex has said, our, our capabilities, you know, uh, you know we, we, as who is XMI API, you know, we are strong on the data side. So mm -hmm. uh, therefore our target a lot of times uh, on the data side, is big organizations or cybersecurity companies who uh, utilize our data to further improve their endpoint security products to help the end users better. Um, so that's who is XML API side as a supplier of, uh, of data. Uh, and then on our other company, Threat Intelligence Platform TIP side, uh, that, that's where we have a further vision uh, to become a security analysis platform and, you know, to, to help the end uh, retail organizations better. Um, but, but that is still a very you know, fledgling new company that, and, you know, uh, for the future. Yeah. So I just want to add that, uh, you know, perspective on the overall yeah. organizations. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I wish you all the best with TIP and it's, it's always a pleasure working with who is XML API. Um, I'd link the, the descriptions uh, and your profile to LinkedIn in the comments below if anybody wants to have uh, a, a more detailed conversation about what is cyber threat intelligence or attack surface management. I, I highly recommend uh, talking to these guys because these are the experts. So yeah, that has come to an end of this amazing webcast with Wiz XML API again. Um, yeah, and take care and stay safe, guys. We'll Thanks. see you Happy in holidays. another. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Happy Thank holidays. You. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah.